Hey everyone, today's lesson is going to be on rigid motions, stretching, and spin in arbitrary motions. So rigid motions and stretching and spin in arbitrary motions. This will be chapters 10 and 11 in the textbook. Um, we're skipping a little bit of them, <clears throat> so you should read those chapters in their entirety. We'll present some of this stuff a little bit different, namely any time that they talk about the infinitesimal fibers I'm going to do it in terms of curves embedded in the material because I think it probably makes more sense to look at that way. But read it both ways and maybe maybe the other way will make more sense to you. I think my way makes more sense to me, but you know, we're all different. All right, so a motion is called rigid if it preserves the distance between all pairs of points for all time. So, chi of x and t. We have the partial derivative with respect to time of the norm of chi of x t minus chi of, we'll say, y t for fixed x and y is equal to 0 for all x and y in the material body. <coughs> So a rigid motion doesn't change the distance between points. Um, actually, by definition, it doesn't have a rate of change of the distance between two points. Um, but of course, if the rate of change is always zero, then there's <clears throat> never any change in the distance. Well, if you consider a triangle in the reference configuration, let's say we got a point A, a point B, and a point C in the reference body. And the sides are of length L1, L2, and L3. Then let's say that we have some rigid motion and that deforms to A. Well, 
that didn't work. B. C. In the spatial configuration. Well, the lengths between all of those have to be the same as they had been. So if the three side lengths of this triangle <coughs> are the same as the three side lengths of this triangle, then we know that they are similar triangles. So it's just a rotation and a translation of this one over to here. You know, there's no changes in the angles or anything. <coughs> well, this applies to any such triangle. You know, you could pick any three points <coughs> that aren't collinear in the reference configuration, and that applies. You know, everything's going to be a rotation plus a translation. Um, so that sort of implies that a rigid motion with this definition is, is consistent with the idea of a rigid motion being a rotation and a translation that you've probably heard before. Um, there's an equivalent definition of it that we can do in terms of the velocity, which basically says that the difference in velocity between two points in the spatial configuration has to be perpendicular to the vector between the two points. x minus y in the spatial configuration dot the velocity at x and t minus the velocity at y and t is equal to scalar 0 for all x and y in the deformed body, and for all t. <clears throat> this can be obtained by differentiating the first definition after substituting in the norm squared being v dot v. All right, we can take the spatial gradient of this one with respect to x. So considering y as a constant, Then we have that the gradient of the whole thing, x minus y dot v 
x comma t minus v y comma t. <coughs> well, that's going to be the spatial gradient of the scalar field 0. So that is the vector field 0. And if we use grad u dot v is equal to grad u transpose v plus grad v transpose u on this, then we end up with the transpose of grad x minus y acting on v of x and t minus v y and t. plus the gradient of this whole thing transpose acting on x minus y is equal to scalar 0. All right, well, grad x minus y is equal to grad x minus grad y since the gradient is a linear operator, you know, it's a derivative. <clears throat> well, y is constant here. We're holding it fixed. So grad y is 0, and grad x is the identity. So that is equal to the identity tensor. So we have that the identity tensor Oh, likewise, you know, since y is fixed, the gradient of this is going to be 0. So this whole thing is just the transpose of the gradient of v of x and t. Let's write that out. Well, the This whole thing here is the identity transpose, so that is just v x and t minus v y t. And that uh, plus the transpose of the gradient x and t, transpose acting on x minus y is equal to 0. Here. So now we've differentiated it <clears throat> with respect to x holding y fixed. We can again take the spatial gradient, but now with respect to y holding x fixed, um, there are you know two arguments to our function here, the x and the y, so we're free to do that. Take the derivative of each independently. In other words, this, um, <clears throat> this statement right here is a, a vector equation 
in, you know, three independent variables, x, y, and t. So we're free to take partial derivatives with respect to x, y, or t independently, which is why there's kind of two notions of gradient. Um, so for a little bit here, I'm going to use y as a subscript when we're gradienting with respect to y, since we're used to thinking it in respect to x. But uh, yeah, let's do that now. All right, well, the gradient now with respect to y of v, x, and t minus grad v, y, and t. This is gradient sub y. And then plus the gradient with respect to y. So we're just taking the gradient with respect to y of this one right here. Uh, ooh. Let's see if we can use technology to our advantage for once or if it's going to once again back sass me. All right, put that whole thing in some curly braces. All right, well, the gradient of a vector field is a tensor field. So now this is equal to tensor zero. <coughs> well, x is fixed, so this is equal to zero. And this here is independent of y. So its gradient is 0. So when we apply the product rule to the whole thing, we actually only end up with the constant this times the gradient of this with respect to y. So what do we have? We have minus grad v of y and t where we get there? Oh, there we plus grad v x and t transpose. Well, the gradient of x is 0 in this case, and the gradient of y is 1. is equal to <clears throat> 0. All right, so you know this one here is the gradient with respect to y, and this is the gradient with respect to x. Or really just the gradient of v, whoopsies, evaluated at y and x. And so uh, what do we get? We get that um, if we consider y equals 
x, right? y is arbitrary and x is arbitrary. So in the special case where they're equal, we can show then that, um, you know, so this here is for all x, y in bt for all t. And so we can consider the special case, y equals x. And so then we have that the gradient, whoopsies, of v evaluated at x and t <coughs> is equal to minus the gradient, right, so the, this minus here, this plus here, makes them of the same side when they're on the same side of the equal sign, so that's equal to minus the transpose of the gradient of the evaluated at x and t. All right, so this shows us that the gradient of the velocity is skew symmetric in a rigid motion. And if we look back up here, you know, we see that the gradient of v at y and t is then equal to minus the gradient of v evaluated at x and t, or rather is equal to the gradient if we get rid of the minus and the transpose. We'll just... Uh, make that a little more abundantly clear here. Start a new page. All right, so we've shown that it's skew for all points. And we've also shown, well, that is equal to grad v, x and t, for all x and y in the spatial configuration body and for all time. All right, so the, the gradient is in fact uniform, spatially constant. So that's pretty cool. That's getting to be looking a lot like <coughs> what we already knew about rigid motions. And the book just kind of has a different, more mathematical way of defining them that leads to sort of the representation form that we're used to seeing. The skew symmetric part of the velocity gradient in a general motion is called the spin tensor and is denoted with a capital W. <coughs> and when I say velocity gradient, I'm talking spatial velocity gradient. So 
w is equal to skew l. This is 1 half l minus l transpose. For a rigid motion, w is uniform, so spatially constant, but it can vary in time. So we have that V of X and T is equal to V, this is for a rigid motion, of Y and T plus W of T. So that's the spin tensor acting on the vector X minus Y. So let's let little w, the vector, be the axial vector of big W. <clears throat> so then the x and t is equal to v y and t plus axial vector cross x. Well, let's make that a w of t. Cross x minus y. <coughs> well, we can look at the curl of v. we had a neat formula for the curl of the cross product of two vectors. This is the curl, you know, with respect to x, so y is fixed, so the curl of v, y, and t is nothing. It's for a fixed y. So we're just looking at the curl of this term here. Well, that is equal to the spatial divergence. This is the spatial curl. of w, the axial vector of tensor w, tensor product, the vector x minus y, minus x minus y, tensor product w. So then we had a nice formula for the divergence of the tensor product of two vectors. And we can split that up, and we're going to get four terms here. That is equal to W times the divergence of X minus Y. This is going to be for a fixed Y. Plus the gradient of W acting on X minus Y. So this was taking the first term here and applying that one formula to it. And then it is minus x minus y div w minus the gradient x minus y acting on W. All right. Well, the divergence of X is equal to 3 because the gradient of X is equal to the identity 
and its trace is equal to 3 in three dimensions. And the divergence of y is equal to 0 because the gradient of y is equal to 0. So this whole thing here is equal to div x is equal to 3. w is constant, so this is equal to 0. And likewise, the divergence of w is equal to 0 because it's a constant. And so we have that the curl of v is equal to 3w minus, well, the gradient of x minus y is the identity minus 0 is equal to the identity. So we have 3w minus w is equal to 2w. <coughs> so the curl of the velocity is twice the axial vector of the spin tensor, at least for a rigid motion. So a rigid velocity field based on all of this is one that can be expressed as the sum of a displacement and a rotation about a point. So V of X and T is equal to alpha of T, a vector that is a function only of time, not of space, plus lambda of T, another vector that is a function only of time and not of space, cross product X minus some origin that we have picked. And so that's how it is, you know, commensurate with what you've probably already seen for rigid motions. So we'll skip the, uh, the last part of chapter 10 on motions whose velocity gradient is symmetric and spatially constant. However, it is applicable to some of the discussion in chapter 11. So I would encourage you to read it. Um, but it's one where, you know, I don't really have anything to add or particular insight on it. It's a pretty straightforward section there. So let's get on to stretching and spin in arbitrary motion. <coughs> Well, for any motion, if the velocity is differentiable, then we have this. Never notice how big words are until you have to write them all the darn time. 
then we have v of x and t minus v of y and t is equal to l we'll say of y and t minus or not minus times times x minus y and then that would be plus things that go to zero faster than the distance between x and y like that <clears throat> All right, so the velocity gradient can be decomposed into symmetric and skew symmetric parts. It's, you know, a nice easy additive decomposition. And we give both of these letters and names that are sort of reserved for them because we're going to use them all the darn time. So we have the tensor D is equal to the symmetric part of L. So that is equal to 1 half grad V plus grad V transpose. Let's put the whole thing in <coughs> brackets like that. And then the spin tensor, which we've already talked about, W is equal to skew L is equal to 1 half grad V minus its transpose. All right, so in that case, we have that V of any point X is equal to v of some fixed point y. This is, you know, for a given time, uh, plus w, the spin tensor, acting on x minus y, plus d, acting on x minus y, plus things that go to zero faster than the distance between x and y. So locally, if you zoom in pretty far, we see that the velocity, you know, and in fact the motion in general, is going to look like a local rigid motion. And these here, um, let's make that explicitly the case. This is W of Y and D of Y. So let's, hey, don't do that. Move it over a little. And then uh, we'll call this a local motion with, uh, you know, uniform symmetric velocity gradient.
So this is a, um, you know, and they talk about this in the second part of chapter 10, um, but basically it's just a non isotropic. So there's three different mutually orthogonal directions and it just has a rate of stretching or squishing in each of those three mutually orthogonal directions. So, you know, W, we already said, is called the spin tensor, and D is called the stretching tensor. All right, so the spin axis is the span of the axial vector of the tensor W. Um, this is then at any local point, you know, it's the local spin axis. And that's just the, you know, one dimensional space where um, the spinning isn't moving it. Everything's kind of spinning around that axis. Now, the spin axis is a spatial axis because W, D, and L are all spatial tensors. They map spatial vectors to spatial vectors. Another way of calling this would be the null space of W. It's the set of vectors A satisfying W acting on A is equal to zero. So like L, the velocity gradient, it's skew symmetric and symmetric parts map spatial vectors to spatial vectors. So they are called spatial tensor fields. Or we'll just say spatial tensors. <clears throat> All right, let's uh, take a little bit of time here to relate L, D, and W to the rates of change of our stretch tensors, U and V. Actually, we're just going to do it for U, and then you can use the fact that V is related to U by R. Um, and then uh, we'll also look at what the rotation tensor does to things here. rotation tensor R. All 
All right, well, from before we have that L is equal to F dot F inverse. And let's say that F, the polar decomposition of it, is equal to R U for the right polar decomposition. So F inverse. is equal to u inverse r inverse is equal to u inverse r transpose since r is a rotation. So we can substitute that in to L and use the product rule on f equals r u. L is equal to r dot u plus r u dot u inverse r transpose. <clears throat> we can multiply that out. That is equal to r dot, well u, u inverse, that goes away. That just becomes the identity. So it's r dot, r transpose. And then plus r u dot, u inverse. R transpose. And if we consider this R dot R transpose term, well, R R transpose has to be the identity because it is a rotation tensor. It's in the proper orthogonal group. So So if we take the time derivative of that, then we have that r dot r transpose is equal to negative r r transpose dot. Well, that is equal to negative r dot r transpose, the whole thing transpose. So we know that this one is skew. All right, so we found part of w. Um, we have to look at this remaining term here. But first, let's look at D, the stretching tensor, so the symmetric part of L. D is equal to sim L, which we know is equal to the symmetric part of R. U dot U inverse R transpose. Okay, well, we showed in the homework before with a transformation like this, um, the symmetric part of this whole thing is just going to be the symmetric part of this transformed by R and R transpose on the outside. So that is equal to R <coughs> sim U dot 
u inverse r transpose and w is equal to r dot r transpose plus r times the skew part. That's kind of ugly. <clears throat> of u dot u inverse r transpose. So the spin w is composed of a rotational part, you know, in, involving the change, the rate of change of the rotation tensor, and a stretch spin, which we'll talk about in a second. So W R O T is equal to R dot <clears throat> R transpose and a stretch spin. Which is W S T R is equal to R times the skew part of U dot U inverse times R transpose, which is related to the rate of change of the principal stretch directions, so the principal directions of U. So W is equal to W rotation plus W stretch spin. So one thing to think about here, because I know the first time I ever started, I'm like, wait, what? That? Hmm, I don't know about that. Because the first time I saw it, I'm like, well, wait, U is symmetric. So U dot symmetric. So U inverse is symmetric. And the first time I saw it, I was like, is the, the product of symmetric tensors symmetric? <clears throat> sure enough, it isn't. So symmetric tensors and skew symmetric tensors are closed under summation, but their products are not closed under multiplication. Yeah. So you can have it where, uh, where you end up with something that is symmetric, but not necessarily. And uh, the same thing is the case with skew tensors. This is kind of like a complementary case to the fact that rotation tensors or orthogonal tensors are closed under multiplication, but not under addition. And so as a little like thought experiment, let's look at a, a 2D example of the matrix representation of a couple tensors, two symmetric ones and two skew symmetric ones just to, to show you that I'm not, you know, full of it. Um, and I suppose by extension that the book isn't full of it, or, you know, whoever came first, the book. Chicken and egg problem there, right? All right, so one of them, let's say A, B, B, C. So that one is symmetric. And then E, F, F, G. 
So that matrix representation of another tensor is symmetric. Well, we get A E plus B F B E plus C F A F plus B G B F plus C G. All right, so sure enough, this thing, um, if we look at the terms that are off the diagonals there, we can't really say anything about whether it's symmetric or not. Um, you know, in, in fact, I suppose it could even be skew symmetric if we really wanted it to be. You know, we just have to ensure that these two are zero and that this one is minus this one. And you probably have enough room to play there. Um, likewise, zero a minus a zero zero minus b b zero is equal to minus a b zero zero minus a b. So. Boy, at least in two dimensions, you multiply two skew symmetric ones together, you get a symmetric one in this case. In fact, I would say in every case in two dimensions. <clears throat> all right, so at the very least, it's like, all right, we can go back to saying that this makes sense as an idea. You know, you wouldn't necessarily expect this to always be zero, even though each of those is symmetric. So back to L and such, if I get the pen. Um, well, if we have two, F transpose D F, like that. Um, this is one of those where we cherry pick the starting point because we know where we want it to end up, or rather, someone once did after throwing a whole bunch of paper in the garbage. But here we have, actually probably not a whole bunch in this case, but you know, that's where these magical starting points come from. All right, so 2D is just um, L plus L transpose, so the two and the one half cancel out. F. And we can substitute in L equals F dot F inverse. So that is equal to F transpose F dot F inverse, and then plus F inverse transpose F dot transpose acting on F. All right, well, in the first one, this F inverse and this F will cancel out. And in the second one, this F inverse transpose and F transpose cancel out. So we get is equal to F transpose F dot <coughs> plus F dot transpose F. All right, well, if we remember that the, um, it's that the green St. Venant strain tensor, E, is equal to one half F transpose F minus the identity. So then E dot is equal to one half F dot. Well, let's do it in the opposite order so that it looks the same. We'll say we'll differentiate the second one first. F transpose F dot plus F dot transpose F 
and then the time derivative of the identity is zero, so that's it. All right, so then this whole shebang is twice e dot. Well, it's twice that. So we have that f transpose d f is equal to the time derivative of the green St. Renat strain. All right, now for the part where I kind of present a little bit of stuff kind of differently from the textbook because I think that the material embedded curves way of looking at it makes a little more sense. Um, and feel free to chime in if you think it does or doesn't. Uh, maybe you prefer the infinitesimal fibers way of looking at it. And if enough of you do, then I'll present it that way. But, you know, to me, this way makes more sense. Of course, we're almost out of kinematics to talk about, so maybe it becomes kind of immaterial. So suppose we have a material curve C, and we'll parameterize it by a point function of a scalar variable lambda. So our parameterization function we'll call x hat of lambda. And c is the image under this parameterization function of the closed interval from lambda naught to lambda 1. And let's consider a point x in the reference body along this line at some lambda in that interval. All right, well, the, uh, the deformed curve, C sub t, is then just the image of C under the deformation chi. So C sub t is equal to the deformation acting on that parameterized curve, x is the image of that whole thing, at time t. Well, let's call this a parameterization of ct, so we'll call this spatial x hat of, now it's got two variables, lambda and t. So x hat of lambda is a parameterization of ct for time t. All right, let's make a tangent vector, just a dx hat d lambda. This is in the reference configuration. Let t so this would be like the rate you move along C with change in lambda is equal to the, this is full derivative because it's only a function of one variable. And the, um, the spatial counterpart you know, is the one that's materially convecting with it and everything. So let's say that t of lambda and t is equal to the partial derivative 
of x hat for lambda and t with respect to lambda. This is for a fixed t. All right, well, if we go through that then, um, t, lambda, and t is equal to the gradient of the deformation of x lambda, that's an x hat of lambda, so it's the parameterization of our curve in the reference configuration t um, times d x hat d lambda. So that is equal to the deformation gradient That. And of course, this whole deformation gradient mess we can call F. Right, so that's a familiar transformation rule for tangent vectors is that they transform by the deformation gradient. Well, we can say T dot is equal to F dot tr, there would be a plus ftr dot, but tr dot is zero since tr is a, you know, the, the material curve is fixed. All right, well, if we look at t dot, the time derivative of this tangent to the curve, um, then if we look at the component of that, that is along the direction of the curve, that tells us about how much it is stretching or smushing the curve, right? The, uh, the derivative, the components of it that are perpendicular to the curve would talk about how the curve is rotating or something like that, basically. So t dot dot t, so the rate of change of the unit tangent in the direction of the tangent, um, or rather not of the unit tangent, but of the, you know, parameterized tangent is equal to F dot TR dot T. And now we're going to go backward from the way that we go pretty often. Um, that is equal to F dot F inverse T dot T since TR is equal to F inverse T. <clears throat> Typically, we'd, you know, send TR to T by F um, usually, but this one ends up being more useful. All right, well, F dot F inverse is L. So the time derivative of t dot t is equal to L t dot t. Well, that is equal to d t dot t plus w t dot t, where d and w are the stretching and spin tensors, respectively. So they are symmetric and skew-symmetric, respectively. Well, let's look at this. d t dot t is equal to t dot d transpose t is equal to t dot dt, since t is symmetric. So that's fine. Um, 
and w t dot t is equal to t dot w transpose t is equal to t dot minus w t is equal to minus t dot w t. Well, of course, the inner product is symmetric, so that is equal to minus <coughs> w t dot t. Well, if uh, this thing here is equal to minus itself, it better be equal to 0. So 0. So in other words, um, only d and not w contributes to, oopsies, to the rate of stretching in the, you know, the, the, the rate of extension or, or squishing of the material curve. w just spins it around. the rate at which material curves are stretched in the deformed configuration. All right, now suppose we have two material curves, C and D, <coughs> and we're going to parameterize them by A hat of lambda and B hat of omega. Start a new page then. And this is with, um, <coughs> you know, lambda in the closed interval, lambda naught, lambda one, and omega in the closed interval, omega naught, omega one. And let's say that C and D intersect at a point X in the reference configuration. X, which is equal to, we'll say, A hat of some lambda A, which is also equal to B hat of some omega A. So similar to before, we're going to make their reference configuration tangents. So these are not necessarily unit tangents unless uh, unless these are parameterized by arc length. So SR is the tangent to C in the reference configuration. And T R 
is going to be the tangent to d, which is parameterized by b. All right, well, like we've said, um, the deformed tangents, the derivative with respect to the parameterization lambda or omega variable is going to be s is equal to f s r and t is equal to f t r. So we have the cosine of theta is equal to s dot t, where theta is the interior angle between the two curves, over the magnitude of s times the magnitude of t. So if we look at the time derivative of the cosine of theta, we just take the time derivative of that whole mess using the quotient rule. is equal to you know, the bottom times the time derivative of the top. Minus the top. times the time derivative of the bottom. All over the square of the bottom there. All right, well, if we look at the first term here, um, this magnitude s, magnitude t can get rid of the squareds. And if we look at the second term, we see that, you know, this and one of the magnitude s, magnitude t goes to cosine theta. So that is equal to s dot t, the time derivative of the whole sheet bang, over magnitude s, magnitude t, and then minus cosine theta times the time derivative of the product of their two amplitudes over s amplitude t. All right, so now the time derivative of s dot t is equal to the time derivative of s dot t plus s dot time derivative of t. Well, that we've already shown somewhere up there is equal to L S dot T plus S dot L T, which um, is equal to Two sim L, right? So this is going to be L plus L transpose S dot T. So in other words, we took the transpose of L here and combined it into one term. All right, well, that is equal to two. D 
s dot t is equal to 2 d t dot s. All right, and let's go back up to this formula here for the time derivative of the cosine of theta. Um, we could expand all these nasty terms out and get something that wouldn't really give us a whole lot more insight. But uh, instead, let's consider the case where they are perpendicular at time t so that <coughs> cosine of theta is equal to zero. Well, all right, then, um, then for S and T, materially convecting tangent vectors that are perpendicular at time T, so this is saying what the velocity gradient or the symmetric part of it is doing to right angles, you know, how it's smooshing them. Technical term. Then we have the time derivative of the cosine of the angle between them is equal to 2 d s dot t over magnitude s magnitude t. So of course, if they are unit vectors, then you just need to take the <coughs> top part there. And um, so for theta equals pi over 2, then, you know, you use the time derivative of theta relative to the time derivative of its cosine. Um, and we have that cosine theta, the time derivative of that, is equal to theta dot, or rather minus theta dot, right, because the derivative of cosine is minus sine, and the sine of pi over 2 is 1. So restricting our, so continuing to restrict our attention to s and t perpendicular at our time, we have that the rate of change of the angle between them that was initially a right angle goes with minus 2 d s dot t over s magnitude t. So if we define E, S, and E, T as unit vectors in those directions, then is equal to negative 2 D E, S dot E, T, uh, where, ah, come on, E, S is equal to S over its own magnitude, and E t is equal to t over its own magnitude at time t. 
All right, that's all we got on chapters 10 and 11 here. We'll get um, another lecture or two on 12 and 13. I'm hoping I can get that down to one lecture. Um, and then let's see back in the textbook here. You know, like I said, we're going to skip around a little bit here, skip over some stuff. But I, I still expect you to read it unless I say, you know, totally skip over it. So, like, today we didn't talk about the last part of Chapter 11, um, stretching and spin using the current configuration as reference. Uh, I think it's an interesting thing to look at. And it uh, is definitely something that plays in, like, nonlinear elasticity finite element methods, like where they do kind of relative deformation to the current configuration. Um, but I think it should be pretty easy for you guys and gals to understand. So, you know, I don't think we need to devote the time to it in the interest of getting through things a little more quickly. Um, yeah, so 12 and 13 we'll go through. Um, you know, 13 I probably won't cover in huge detail, although you should read it and try to understand it. Um, probably won't directly cover the not quite two page chapter 14 in class, but there again, um, I think you should look at it and we'll hit chapters 15 and 16. Um, I think you guys can read chapter 17 on your own. I might do a little bit of a thing on vorticity, but yeah, then we'll be getting into balance laws and basic mechanical principles. All right. Have a good one. Catch you all later.